Hey guys, so in this video I thought I'd try and attempt to answer what is actually an interestingly difficult question. When does sadness or grief or feeling down become depression or depressive illness? Because it's normal to feel sad, it's normal to grieve, it's normal to have episodes where you're feeling low, but when does normal become pathological? If you're new here, my name's Sil. I'm starting as a junior doctor in about a month and a half with a psychiatry team in Sydney. I'm making a series of mental health videos because I think it's such an important global problem. Depression will affect each and every one of us, either directly or indirectly. So let's get started. So what is sadness? Sadness is specific. It's usually a consequence of an event that makes you feel sad. It's often brief relatively, like it could last hours to a day, but during that time, it's still possible for you to feel happiness or or some amounts of joy so you know if if, uh, if your pet died like if I thought about my dog dying that's an awful thing for me because I absolutely love a puppy but if I would be very sad but say whilst I'm feeling sad about my puppy um, I find out that maybe one of my sisters is pregnant and I'm gonna get a new niece or nephew that would make me feel happy I would feel a bit of joy it would be complicated because I'd have sadness and joy but I would be feeling these emotions Often when you're sad, your thoughts, um, although sad, are realistic. They're based in reality. There's no thoughts around like there's no future for you and uh, there's no hope, there's no way out of this kind of thing. And you can often have thoughts about the future, that there is still a future for you. Depression is opposite to these things on almost every single account. It's general in nature. Often you don't know what caused it. And it, when we're trying to evaluate someone with depression, we don't actually... Like it doesn't always matter what the uh, cause of it was. It doesn't really change what the management is. So what really matters, matters is the set of symptoms that they experience, but it's usually just general in nature. Also, when I was saying with, with sadness that you feel sadness, but you can also feel joy with depression. Often it's, there's anhedonia, which is this emotional bluntedness, this lack of emotion. You just don't feel anything. There's no motivation. There's no, sometimes it's not, you don't even feel sadness. You just feel this kind of, a emotional state, this unemotional state. Also with depression, there's usually a lot of unrealistic um, beliefs. Sometimes they border on uh, delusional where you can feel so guilty, so bad that um, you have this sense of worthlessness that uh, can unfortunately link deeply with suicidality and it's uh, extremely dangerous. So those are some of the key differences between depression and sadness. I'm going to now share with you guys a clip of the actual criteria that clinicians use to diagnose a depressive disorder. But before I share with you this clip, I just want to have a little, a little rant. I just want to make it clear that um, as healthcare professionals, as mental health professionals, we understand that mental health is not a checklist. It's not a list of symptoms. It's more than that. It's the experience. It's the life. It's the psyche. It's, 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 it's global. And, and when we use checklists, sometimes it feels to patients that we're minimizing their experience. That's not what we're trying to do. And I'm sorry that that's the way that things have turned out. It's just that we don't have a blood test for depression. We don't have tests that can tell us 100% with 100% certainty that you have this or that disorder. So we have to use a standardized approach, an approach that everyone in Australia, everyone in the world uses so that we can compare different treatment options. Before using checklists, before the DSM, psychiatry was I don't even want to get into it. It was extremely, let's just say, uh, not standardized. And that meant that people could try wild and wacky theories uh, that caused a lot of harm. So it's a good thing that we have these standardized approach, but it's a bad thing that it can sometimes minimize the experience of patients. So here's the list of symptoms from the DSM-5. This is the manual that we use to diagnose uh, mental disorders. Uh, and so let's go to that now. So guys, I don't have a lived experience with depression. I can't really tell you what it's like at a personal or experiential level, but um, this is more from a clinical viewpoint and how uh, different symptoms are used to diagnose it. So let's get started. So there are nine key symptoms that are discussed or at least listed out in the DSM-5. Um, and of these nine, there are two core symptoms. Essentially, the criteria is you need to have five of these nine symptoms, one of which is one of the two core symptoms for two weeks. 
okay? So for over a two week period, you need to have at least five of these symptoms and one of those symptoms has to be one of the two core symptoms. The two core symptoms are persistent low mood and anhedonia. And anhedonia is this loss of interest, this loss of emotion, this loss of reactivity, okay? It's this blunted kind of um, emotional state, which is a-emotional, it's unemotional, it's just, devoid of emotion. Anhedonia and dysphoria are the first two on the nine. The other ones are change of body weight, insomnia or hypersomnia, so sleeping too little or sleeping too much. Now with insomnia and depression, it's the most common form is uh, early morning wakening. So they can actually fall asleep fine, but then they usually wake up 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and they just can't get back to sleep. Psychomotor agitation or slowing is a really uh, important symptom as well. And that's one that's usually quite uh, it's more commonly seen as an, by an observer, so that highlights the importance of getting a collateral history, or maybe you'll observe it yourself from the end of the bed or um, in the kind of psychiatric interview. The next symptom is fatigue, uh, and that's pretty obvious. If you're not sleeping well, you'll probably feel quite fatigued. Uh, even if they're sleeping a lot though, they'll get a sense of fatigue. They might get a sense of uh, deep guilt. Sometimes it's even delusional, and if it's uh, really quite delusional levels of guilt. You're concerned about a subtype of depression where it's depression with uh, psychotic features. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to know whether the guilt is delusional or just from the depression. You might see that they have poor concentration. They're not following um, the question. They can't even watch TV shows anymore. Something like that uh, is another symptom. So poor concentration. And finally, most importantly, um, this absorption and uh, constant thoughts around suicidality and death. Now, those are the different symptoms um, one can experience in a major depressive disorder, but it's really important that as with all kind of psychiatric diagnoses, uh, these symptoms are having a functional impact on the person's life. And that's a little bit vague as to what defines a functional impact, but usually it's a change from the baseline. Two other important points to make is that these symptoms are not a consequence of organic illness. Now, when we use the term organic illness in this context, obviously all mental health is a consequence of brain biology and the environment, so it's technically organic, but what we mean or what psychiatrists mean when they use the term organic is that it's not from another biological process of another organ. So so for example, hypothyroidism uh, that's mimicking as a depression. And the final uh, important point to make about these symptoms is that there has never historically been a manic episode because with mania, with bipolar conditions, um, the majority of the illness is actually uh, a depressed state with you know, only occasional um, manic episodes. So there you have it. That's the list of symptoms that you want to look out for. Also guys, just as, as a bit of a disclaimer, this is not medical advice. This is just general education to empower you to approach your GP or your healthcare professionals with the information that can um, help you get the diagnosis you might need or, um, you know, help you approach any loved ones if you're concerned or anything like that. And if you have symptoms that aren't in that list from the DSM-5, remember there are lots of other different depressive illnesses. I'll try and rattle some off the top of my head. There's seasonal affective disorder, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, there's, um, what is it? Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Uh, what else is there? P uh, cyclothymic disorder, persistent dysphoric disorder. Those are all the ones that are at the top of my head, but the point is there's lots of them out there. So that list is not the be all and end all of all depressive illnesses. It's just for major depressive disorder. You may uh, have other symptoms that are uh, linked to other subtypes of depression or other things. So you need to talk to your healthcare professional. I hope that point has been made clear, sorry. That is it for this video. I hope uh, this was helpful. If it was, please consider leaving a like for the video. That really helps uh, me personally. You could also consider subscribing to the channel if um, you want more videos. Leave a comment. I'm a small channel, but I love interacting with um, the people who watch my videos and uh, you can also request videos. I'm happy to um, oblige. <laughs> oh, also, if you found anything distressing in this video, please consider contacting your GP or if it's an emergency, please consider contacting Lifeline on 13114. All right. Okay. Bye for now.